So the next thing we need to outline is the difference between posture and confirmation. And I'm sure I'm teaching you to suck eggs here, but I'm going to go over it anyway. Confirmation is the shape or structure of something, like the length of bones, for instance. Confirmation cannot be changed. It is congenital or it can, however, so that's not completely correct. It can very slowly be affected over long periods of time due to Wolf's Law, et cetera, et cetera. Now, posture, however, can be completely changeable and instantly. Let's take this hind leg. The shape and sizes of the bones are what they are. Wolf's Law tells us that the bones can change according to stresses placed upon them, but again, this happens slowly over time. The posture of the horse is where it chooses to place those bones in space. They can change the angle of joints and the orientation of the bones, but their conformation hasn't changed. Their posture has. Now, posture is something that Farrery can directly affect. So knowing the difference between the two becomes important in making Farrery decisions or in recognising that there needs to be changes in Farrery. Now, going back to our analogy of the table and the whole body assessment, we can take a brief look at what the ideal from a podiatry related view could be. Now, considering we want even load on the hoof, right? So the front leg is designed to be a weight bearing structure. So it should have a column like conformation. And much of its dampening system above the hoof is from its muscular attachment. Whereas the hinds have a concertina effect, which allows them to provide propulsive power and allows the reciprocal apparatus to function the way that it does. Now, like we said, every horse will have biological variation. They'll have different length bones, different angles to their joints, a different conformation. But something that is emerging more forcefully as an ideal is the ideal that all horses should have vertical metatarsals as a posture. When they are in this orientation, they are counteracting gravity efficiently and bearing load in pure compression. Now, in my experiential opinion, I have noticed that non-vertical metatarsals are almost always associated with pathology and poor hoof morphology. And that, of course, applies both from this lateral view and also, so imagine you're looking at the horse from the front or the back, vertical metatarsals. Basically, a picture, a picture, a table from the front and back side to side. So just to drive home the point, confirmation and posture are very different things. We need to understand what Farry can affect or help with and what Farry can only manage because it can't change because it's confirmation. It's really important we understand that. So having outlined that the hoof is a product of everything above it and its interaction with the ground, we can say that as farriers, and this is how, what I practice, the first thing to do when you get to a horse is not look straight down at the feet but look at the general posture of the animal. And I get, of course, this is what you can do when you're assessing if it's farrow related or not, because this can tell you a lot about what you can expect to see when you do look at the feet. So if you're seeing a certain posture, it's going to tell you you're going to see a certain morphology in the foot. It also tells you what may need to be done in order to create a more ideal posture, which will, of course, protect the horse's musculoskeletal system from the foot to the spine, to the pole, the whole horse. Now, we, we need to be shoeing the horse and not just his feet. And that means if you're treating the horse, you need to consider the feet. For instance, if you look at this chap, you can see his metatarsal is slightly angled towards the trunk. It's quite minimal. But this tells me I may well see morphological effects on the hind hooves. And this posture will cause musculoskeletal strain which we'll just we will discuss further later on. Now, conversely, if as owners or practitioners, you look at the whole horse and see postural changes, you have to consider that the hoof 
may be a contributing factor. But, and this is again a big but, we must understand that posture is affected by many more variables than just the hoof. And the hoof could therefore, the hoof proportions could therefore be a product of the posture. So then you create, you get cycles. Nonetheless, podiatry should make every effort to create as solid a base as possible to facilitate ideal posture. Now, after looking at the whole horse, when we then look at the digit, we have some established ideals that we're looking for. And it's really important that you be, are able to recognize the ideal because the not ideal is going to have an effect on posture. We're going to look at the hoof past an axis. We're going to look at the gravitational load line. So a line dropped through the center of mass of the limb. We're going to look at the hairline pathway, the heel angle, the dorsal palmar balance, and the dorsal wall angle compared to the heel angle. Now, what we want to see is a straight hoof past an axis. And the hoof past an axis is directly affected by the ratio between the height of the heel and toe and their angles. Now, the height of the heel and the toe and their angles is directly affected, if you remember back to the hoof function lecture, is directly af affected by how well the hoof is functioning. It's going to have a direct effect on its proportion. So that's why all of that was relevant, because if that's not functioning correctly, then we're not going to have the correct proportions of the hoof. And that's been proven by studies, but we won't get into those. So if, for instance, if we think back to the image I just showed where the horse was camped under behind, I could, depending on how long it had been standing like that and how strong its hooves are. And so how, if it's got a, a strong composition or weak composition hoof, expect to see that the angle difference between the heel and toe getting larger with the heel angle getting more acute because of the loads that are being placed on the hoof in that camped under posture. Now, this brings us to what I've called here the hairline pathway. In this foot, you can see how it begins to drop off at the heels. And you can also see the same if you look cl closely in the actual horn tubules, they drop off as you get to the heels. So, although this foot looks like an okay foot, these heels are already starting to prolapse. The more they prolapse, the more the hoof past an axis will be broken and the more the posture will be affected. So this is where you see how the relationship forms between the whole horse assessment and the hoof assessment and also how everything we spoke about before as in functionality of the hoof plays a role essentially in posture because it has a direct effect on the proportions of the hoof. Sorry, can I just ask a question there? Because something's just leapt into my mind. Is that yes. in the same way that musculature and muscle development can indicate a training program, basically, over time? Yeah. In other words, if you go to an auction, you don't know anything about the horse and you buy a horse and you can almost tell from the posture and the muscle development what the horse has been doing, how it's been trained, basically. Would you say then that we can relate that to the feet uh, in terms of this photo? Yeah, okay. 100%. Okay. What, you, what, what you're seeing, and I do another whole lecture on recognising the ideal. Um, I would touch, we will touch on it briefly in the next few slides, okay. recognising the ideal. But yes, absolutely. If you, if you assess the hoof and see that it's not ideal as a farrier, there are certain things that you're going to look at certain things you're going to recognize which indicate different interventions yeah absolutely oh great if only everyone could learn that anyway um <laughs> right so now we're going to we're going to go through a little bit about recognizing the ideal right okay so this is important for you to be able to do to is to, to recognize the ideal so in this view there are certain established ideals that we should be aiming for this is whether you're barefoot or shod by the way Again, we should have a straight line through the pastern and the hoof and balance around the center of rotation. 
which can be found by dropping a line down from the intersection of the first and second third of a line along the hairline. So if you look at that red line I've done along the hairline, the line dropped is exactly one third of that line. That line tells you where the center of rotation of the hoof is. So you need to have balance around that line in order to create biomechanical efficiency. Now that's another whole lecture, but so but just recognize that you need to have balance around that. So if you look at the bottom blue line, you can see there's 50% of that blue line in front of that and 50% of that line behind that. And that is what we need to have in the shod foot. But in a bare foot, you're more likely to have closer to 60-40 because obviously you, have, you can't add the length of the shoe. Um, but anyway, what we should have is a heel angle and a toe angle that are also within a, and a few degrees of each other. Now, all of this should be assessed from a lateral picture taken at 90 degrees to the digit and at ground level. So when you're assessing the digit, you, you need to do it correctly. You need to take a photo, put your camera actually on the floor, horizontally on the floor at 90 degrees to the hoof, and then you can properly assess these different things we're going to talk about now. So another ideal to be looking for is the height ratio between the height of the hairline at the bulbs of the heel compared to the height of the hairline at the toe. Now, in my studies, I have found that ratios between three heel heights to one toe height and two heel heights to one to, uh, toe height usually translate to a straight hoof pattern axis, depending, of course, on the individual's conformation. So some horses will need three to one, some horses need two to one. Outside of, of these, you tend to get either a broken back or broken forward hoof pattern axis. Now, as you can see, the horses have different dorsal wall angles and different heel to toe ratios, but they all have acceptable hoof past and axes. This is important because very often I see people trying to put an exact number onto what the ideal is. But we're dealing with nature and the, there are ranges of numbers that work together to create an ideal in terms of proportions and alignment. Now, this slide and the previous slide talking about heel to toe ratios brings us on to the next parameter for when you're assessing Farrery, the caudal hoof. The frog, bulbs of the heel, digital cushion and lateral cartilages, which if you remember are all part of that hemodynamic system. The health of these structures are directly responsible for creation of the ideal proportions of the digit and therefore the orientation of the limb and therefore can directly affect posture. So this ratio we're talking about here has huge knock-on effects. Now the region of this region of the hoof is so often overlooked by farriers and owners alike, and yet having healthy caudal hoof structures is one of the most important areas in the whole horse to look after because, as I said, it affects the whole horse. So when we then go to look at the bottom of the hoof, from what we've seen in the previous assessments, I'll expect to see certain shapes and morphologies. Basically, what we're looking for here is symmetry and well-formed structures. I think we're so used to seeing poorly conformed feet that they've become an unacceptable norm and we often forget what they're actually meant to look like. So, for instance, the frog, central sulcus and bulbs, we're so used to seeing contracted frogs, prolapsed bowls with deep central sulci and thrush that it's almost become not worth noting. But the reality is the health of the back of the hoof will affect those ratios we mentioned before and have a profound effect on posture. And also, if you remember, will have an effect on how efficiently that horse can absorb the concussion of locomotion. So recognising a healthy frog in digital cushion is a very, very important thing. I can't emphasise enough. The frog and the digital cushion, bars and heels being strong, is the foundation for good hoof proportions and therefore posture and therefore, of course, 
musculoskeletal soundness. So how do we recognize them? So the frog is supposed to be around 50 to 60% as wide as it is long and have a small shallow depression as a central sulcus. The bulbs of the heel should be equal and have a smooth shallow valley between them. The bars should be straight and symmetrical and the soles should be nicely vaulted. We can, of course, assess some mediolateral imbalances from this view, which is indicated by the red lines. So down the middle of the foot should be equal either side. So again, there we're looking for symmetry of the two sides of the hoof. And grossly poor asymmetry can be indicative of poor conformation and or where poor hoof balances are influencing the posture of the horse. Talk about that a bit more later. We also may be able to see these influences by looking at other structures like the white line and the bars. So if they're flared or the bars are bent, that's telling us that we're that hoof is struggling and it's morphing. Now, taking a closer look at the back of the foot, which again is really often missed, can tell you a lot about how the hoof is morphing. So first of all, I have to thank Lindsay Field, study of equine hoof, for allowing me to use her image on the bottom right corner, which I've adapted to show the valley that is often created by co poor caudal hoof structures or the lack of the use of the caudal hoof structures. And again, if we don't have that functionality that we talked about in the first structure, in, in the first lecture, this is what happens to the caudal hoof. And this will again affect hoof proportions, which affects the body, the limb orientation, and then the body. So the lateral cartilages should cover around a third of the back of the hoof each, with a nice plump digital cushion filling in between them. Now, when you see these lateral cartilages getting closer or one higher than the other or any other kind of asymmetries, we know we are seeing shunting or some kind of contraction, and this can be one heel or both. So if you look at the um, white foot in the top picture you've got two lateral cartridges that are nice and symmetrical with a nice plump digital cushion in the middle of them whereas if you look at the black foot in the top you can see the lateral cartridges are not symmetrical and not even and they've been squished together so this is telling you the hoof is morphing so here we start we started at the top of the horse and discussed how the hoof morphs according to what's above it and worked our way down to the frog and the caudal hoof structures. Now, of course, it goes back the other way. Again, poor caudal hoof structures create poor heel to toe ratios. This creates a poor hoof pastern axis. This affects the posture of the limb, especially behind, which we'll look at more. And then the posture of the limb affects the rest of the horse along kinetic chains and myofascial lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, Wednesday the 10th, I've got the webinar with Dr. Gillian Tabor, who's just who's just finished her PhD on posture. Right. Okay, okay that's so, so there's we're gonna have a brilliant debate there. It's gonna be great. So that's um I'll be it's it's gonna be a discussion, that one, between me and her talking about top down versus up that you know, that kind okay. of stuff we've looked at today. And then also on the Saturday after that, yeah, I'm doing a webinar with Dr. Peter Clements, who you would have seen cited in that lecture that I've just given. Yeah, he's just he's just written the latest paper linking negative plantar angles with higher pathology. Ooh. So we're we're going to be talking about his study. He's going to be presenting his study, mm -hmm. and also we're going to be talking about others comparing it to other studies talking about future studies and just generally talking about the link between negative plantar angles and higher pathologies so gosh you're really on the case <laughs> well look i don't think we can keep you any longer we'd love to keep you here for another two hours because i've got a full, yeah. full page of questions <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean you you answered uh, the, the huge majority of them but yeah i mean yeah can't thank you enough really that's really uh, my pleasure off. thank you for the lovely questions to get me going so <laughs> excellent
<laughs> yeah. As you can tell, I'm quite I'm quite passionate about all this stuff. So yeah, it's, um, yeah. it, it really gets me going. So yeah, but it's it's obvious secret stuff, isn't it? None of it is extremely complex. It's just straight lines, really, isn't yeah. it? And well, I, yeah, I try to make it all as simple as possible. But the, the point the point is is that the functionality of the foot, which we talked about, directly affects its shape. And its shape directly affects its proportions and proportions directly affect the limb orientation. So that's why I worked up like that. Yeah. So. No, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. 